I'm about to head off and feed some animals but I thought I would have a chat to you while I'm going about it about how the best way to get started hobby farming for beginners. Get G'day there, I'm Dana from Piwakaka Valley Homestead. Today I'm off to feed the animals but I thought that I've had a few people ask me where to actually start when it comes to looking for land and how to actually get started homesteading or hobby farming, whatever you want to call it. So um, I've got a few tips about things we've done well, things we haven't done well and so I thought we'd get on and talk about them. One of the very first things uh, that is really important when it comes to starting a hobby farm or starting a homestead of any sort is to pick your land well and honestly that's something that we have a little bit of buyer's remorse about um, here I mean it's a lovely place it's nice and close to the coast it's um, when it's a nice day like this it's absolutely amazing uh, but the reality is it's incredibly steep and incredibly windy uh, we don't have any decent water source here um, and there is a lot of gorse and a lot of unusable place so if I show you over the hill over off yonder there it's incredibly steep it is basically just goat territory if that um, it's so covered in gorse which is a really invasive prickly bush that we have here um, that I mean luckily goats eat it but it's just everywhere through there it's an absolute nightmare to deal with um, and when we were buying here we were actually only looking for a quarter acre of usable land um, I'm just gonna go over and feed the pigs because they're being really noisy um, yeah, we're only looking for sort of a quarter acre or maybe more so to get 10 acres for a similar price just a little bit further out of town we thought we'd struck a gold mine but um and we are i mean we are really lucky we're not sad that we're here but if we'd known that we were actually going to be looking for this sort of lifestyle then we probably would have bought something a little bit different <laughs> pushy little madams yeah so tip number one would be choose your land well obviously you can learn to homestead pretty much wherever you are I think there's a lot of homesteading skills that you can learn even if you're living in the city especially around growing your own food and preserving food that sort of thing maybe not so much raising animals these are my sis uh, my daughter's these are my daughter's bentams And the little ladies, they don't need a huge amount of space. They've got a cage that attaches to that run as well. So they get out and have a wander around. But there are some small animals that you can do even in the city. Rabbits would be another example. Rabbits don't need much more than a hutch really. And this little lassie's looking for some food, so I'm going to cut her some grass. The reason I love rabbits is they eat what we grow really well. They eat pretty much all of these weeds and they're just hanging out in the food forest so um, it means that I can trim the grass down around my plants and this really leads nicely onto the second point I would make is when you do finally get your land spend some time thinking about how you're going to use the land and consider looking into some of the more permaculture zoning sort of principles where you put the stuff that you use every day closer to the house and things that you don't need to see so often further away from the house. I've got a link, um, a blog post all about how to use permaculture zones um, to plan your homestead so I'll put a link to that down below for you. So there are some really efficient things that we have done, one of them being this bunny rabbit, it's near the house 
it's right next to the grass that Liv eats and right beside it is a plastic bin full of the pellets that I feed her. So I'm not having to traipse off to a feed shed anywhere. Her food is right there, right where I need it to be. Once you've got yourself some land and you need to have spent some time with it knowing where the sun goes, where the strong winds are, where water pools um, and particularly where the wind is. And if you get big winds like what we do, consider putting in shelter belts as one of the very first things that you put into the, into the ground. Get some plants that will grow nice and quickly and get them in the ground as soon as you possibly can. There's some sparrows having an argument over here. And then once you've got your shelters in, then I think the very next thing you should probably consider doing, other than fencing and making it childproof if you've got children, is to get something growing. Um, if you want to do fruit trees, that's a really good time to get some fruit trees in. If you have space for a vegetable garden, I honestly think that you're probably better off growing vegetables, probably even before you start getting some animals. Um, being able to grow your own garden doesn't rely on having to pay for animals or the infrastructure. You can literally just turn over some ground and get some plants in the ground. Um, and I think, especially if you're not used to having lots of animals, probably getting a garden, getting your gardening skills up is probably the very first thing I would consider doing um, if you're wanting to be sort of self-sufficient. Here's Arnie, he's come to say hello. Alright, these are our goats. Apparently undoing a gate latch one handed is really hard. And we lock these guys up here at night time. Um, we haven't always done that. But because our land doesn't actually have very many internal fences, uh, it's a good way of making sure that everybody's okay. During the summer they like sleeping way out in the bush, which is rather frustrating um, to be able to try to keep an eye on them, to be able to worm them, to be able to clip their hooves, all that sort of jazz. So we've just got this little sort of yard, I guess. It's just a wee short one. You can see where the ladies are over there. There's a fence just behind them. So it's just a little piece of grassy paddock uh, with some water so we can lock them up in here if we need to we can leave them up here especially if it's raining um, but other than that we just sort of open them up and they go out off yonder into the eight acres of gorse and grass and what have you out there um, and they come back at night time for a feed of some grain um, and it's also nice to be able to keep an eye on the girls we've got two girls over there the sisters that are still lying down they're both pregnant. Problem is we're not entirely sure when they're due, so um, we're just keeping an eye on them every day, seeing if they get any closer. These guys don't seem to be in any great hurry to go out into the paddock, they're enjoying lying in the sunshine. If you do want to add animals to your hobby farm, which I presume if you're getting a hobby farm you probably actually want some animals, uh, I suggest you start with some easy ones first. Chickens, probably the most common option. Quail being another good option. And rabbits would be one of the other first things I'd recommend. The reason I recommend those few things is because they're small, they're cheap, they're easy to get hold of, and you can keep them in either portable hutches or in a really simple basic shed that you've built for basically nothing out of recycled things. So this is a really good way of deciding what you're gonna have and get some infrastructure up without it costing you the earth. Oh, it's wobbling the fence I'm trying to lean on. Now I recommend instead of paying a huge amount of money for a massive barn, I recommend you build infrastructure as you go, which does give you a bit of a hodgepodge look. So if you see we have multiple different types of sheds along here, but they're all small. Most of them have been built out of recycled tin or something that we've managed to get for really cheaply. And, um, and just some chicken wire, maybe some posts. And the upside to that is they haven't cost us a lot to build. We've been able to add them as we've got the animals that need them. Um, some of them we have been able to repurpose. 
like this shed immediately behind me used to be the goat shed and we had a milking area and things in there but and then we built the bigger shed which was great for having the cow but then we didn't have the cow anymore because it, she just didn't work well with our property so now that's the goat shed and the old goat shed is now the chicken house so the upside to having the smaller sheds is that you can repurpose them and shuffle them around as you need to the other thing I would suggest is don't rush into really big purchases. So we rushed in and got ourselves a cow because she was really cheap and we thought wonderful we'll be able to have a dairy cow. Uh, the problem was we hadn't researched how they deal with slippery slopely slimy hills in the middle of winter and she ended up slipping and she broke her tail she must have landed square on it I think um, she pugged up the ground up here something horrific because it just gets so muddy just being that wee bit further down the hill um, and it, it just it was just too hard and then we the nation had an outbreak of a particular disease and then no one wanted to lend bulls and it was just one thing after another and even AIing her because we had no other cattle was going to be really really expensive and honestly we didn't look into any of those things before we got her and we regret it because well she causes a whole lot of trouble and then in the end we end up popping her in the freezer because we had no other way of um, getting her pregnant we had no real way of milking her um, but it's no different I guess to raising a beef cow it's just our intentions were different right at the beginning and the other thing was we had a whole lot of I've grown up with Sunyan um, goats that you know the big white milking goats and I love them they're really lovely and so we ended up slowly but surely breeding up quite a wee herd of those and then we realized actually <laughs> we don't drink all that much milk we don't really eat much dairy products as such most of my family is actually dairy intolerant anyway they're okay with goat's milk but they don't really love the flavor of it either so we've decided to swap out um, our onions we've still got one we've swapped out all our other goats we sold them and have got some boar and boar cross so we've got some boar nubians a couple of boar ferals and obviously our buck Arnie that you saw he is a boar as well and we've got a couple pure boar girls so they are a meat breed of goats and um, they're just as friendly as the Sanyans I have discovered their hooves grow way slower which is a fantastic feature they're just as friendly and I have found that we were like oh we'll get the pure breeds and then we can breed them and if we have spares we can sell them but having done one round of breeding, I know it's not very much of an example, but we've done one round. Um, and we have found that the ones that the mother's uh, milking breeds, the babies grow so much faster. They're quite a lot larger. So we think instead of doing a pure breed program here, we're going to do sort of like a meat mongrel sort of thing. Where the mothers will have some milking breeds in them so that they have lots and lots of milk. They're bigger goats generally. So they will tend to have more babies, so um, they're not like the little Nubian, uh, not Nubian, they're not like the little Nigerian dwarfs that have, you know, a bunch, four or five babies each. These ones will have one or two, maybe three. Holly had three, um, but only two of them survived. But with the larger genetics and the extra milk, the babies just grew so much faster. So it's really good to be flexible, be open to changing your mind don't buy into a massive dairy herd or a massive angora herd or whatever until you have tried a few try a few get a couple and see how you think to start with we got two goats um, we got Edith and her brother um, who was a weather we kept him for a little while and then we put him in the freezer as we got the other milking goats as well but having one or two is enough for you to realize you know what fences need fixed or put up or what have you what shelter you're going to need what feeding facilities you're going to need all that sort of stuff and it's much better to find that out with one or two goats than to buy a herd of 30 and discover that your fences are terrible and all 30 goats are way off down the neighbors somewhere so no matter what animals you choose to start with make sure you're researching your breeds really well there's a reason why we have different breeds of different animals and the reality is some of them are better for some stuff than others so you're much better off doing your research go slowly find out and you know just talk to some talk to some breeders around about what breeds they have maybe talk to some other small holders and see what breeds they have um, and don't rush into anything 
uh, and don't be afraid to change your mind if something doesn't isn't working for you there's no reason why you can't sell those and get something that will work for you and make life a lot less stressful for you starting up a hobby farm or a homestead or a lifestyle block whatever you want to call it can be really really expensive and that's not the aim of the game the aim of the game is to make things affordable to be sustainable um, so don't go crazy buying stuff that you don't think you're gonna need add essential infrastructure as you can and if you can't afford it maybe delay it as long as you can maybe see if there's a cheaper alternative option that you can consider using um, some stuff that we have done were sort of non-negotiables right from the beginning uh, putting the big bird netting cage around my vegetable garden was can you see that yes that was one of my non-negotiables I was not planting a garden until I knew I could keep the blackbirds out because I have so many issues with blackbirds um, which is why I'm so annoyed that they're managing to get in at the moment and I can't work out where the hole is uh, so that's really quite frustrating but buy the buy the infrastructure you know you're going to need and don't bust your gut trying to put in other stuff that you're not going to need for a while there's no rush you don't have to have everything set up Oop. you don't have to have everything set up right from the word go there's no one waiting on you there's no one saying you're doing it wrong you need to get it done quickly just do it as you can do it as you can afford it and don't go bankrupt trying to make yourself a self-sufficient farm because that's not what we're aiming for it's really easy to spend every spare moment that you have trying to get infrastructure in, trying to get things built trying to maintain things get gardening done feed animals all that sort of stuff but it's not worth doing if it's at the risk of losing relationships and friendships and families so try and find that balance it is really hard homesteading hobby farming lifestyle blocks whatever you want to call it they're not necessarily for everybody not everybody's cut out for it not everybody realistically has the time in their lives to be able to do it and if it turns out that's not you that's okay too there's no shame in going actually this isn't for me and selling it on let someone who it is for get in and enjoy the hard work that you've put into it already i hope you found this video useful if you have hit the like button consider subscribing to our channel we bring you videos twice a week on growing and preserving your own food we'll see you in the next one